Well, I will try to present this result uh, in the simplest possible way, but uh, at the end of the day, I have also to introduce some technicalities, and then I uh, hope that this will be not too much. And so, let me start speaking about uh, this time reversal symmetry and uh, this induced quaternion structure in this kind of problem, which comes from a typical problem in condensed matter. And uh, uh, I prefer to start from the mathematical formulation of the problem and then eventually to explain which kind of model are represented by this type of theory. And at the mathematical level, the mathematical structure that we consider are the datums of a compact Hausdorff uh, path convective space, which in condensed matter play is played, this role is placed by the Brule zone. And just is a technical condition, which means that B has to be nice enough, a, sub a CW complex in topology. Once we have a space of this type, we can define a topological quantum system in this way. For me, at least, my definition of topological quantum system is simply a continuous map between this space B and self-adjoint operator, which take value in the compact operator in some Hilbert space. Now, this condition about compactness, uh, it's a little bit too much. We can ask a little bit less. We can ask that uh, this operator just has a compact resolvent for each K, but for the, for the aims of this talk, compactness is, uh, is enough. Why compactness is important? Because it means that at each point K, the, let me call the Hamiltonian, each K has a spectrum, which is a finite collection of eigenvalues. And the continuity of this map also implies the continuity of this energy band. Of course, because the number of uh, uh, eigenvalues is finite, I can order this according to the ordering on the real line. What is, I'm saying that I'm considering nothing more than operators which has a typical uh, band structure. In this direction, I have my Brule lens on, and for each point of the Brule lens on, I have a collection eigenvalue of my Hamiltonian. And when I vary the coordinates of the Brule lens on B, I have energy band. And usually, the important situation in physics are situation, at, at least for this business of topological insulator, are the situation in which these energy bands are separated by a gap. A gap which, with this technical word, uh, it's defined by an energy which is called the Fermi energy, which in quantum matter is the, uh, the energy which separated valence band, uh, bands between uh, conducting bands. And this is a characteristic of the gap. Well, but Another important ingredient in physics are symmetries. One symmetry which play a role is uh, this symmetry which is called the time reversal symmetry. In fermionic, in bosonic system, for instance, this is just the symmetry induced by the complex conjugation on the Hilbert space. For fermions, we have to be something more. We have to multiply the complex conjugation between the rotation in the spin states. But nevertheless, at mathematical level, in this business of topological quantum system, we can introduce uh, the time reversal symmetry in a little bit more formal way. First of all, we need a little bit of structure on the Brule zone. We need an involution. Involution is just a map which squares to the identity. And uh, this involution has to be combined also with an anti-unitary operation in the Hilbert space. Indeed, what we need is an Hilbert space which is endowed with a complex conjugation. Of course, if this, uh, this Hilbert space is L2 of something, C can be the ordinary complex conjugation. But uh, if I don't define this space H, I have just to assume this extra structure. And well, once I have an involution based on the Brule zone, I have a complex conjugation my Hilbert space, I can define a time reversal symmetry for a topological quantum system in this way. I need a unitary map 
which uh, goes from the Brulen zone to the unitary operator on H. And I say that my Hamiltonian HK has a time reversal symmetry if when I conjugate my Hamiltonian with this family of unitary operator, I obtain the complex conjugate of the Hamiltonian at the point TK. It's the point K sended by the involution in its image tau K. One. Second, I need also a condition on this family of unitaries. The, I can define the inverse of my unitary at point K, has the complex conjugated of my unitary at the point tau K, plus a sign. This sign, indeed, this eta, which could be plus or minus one, distinguishes between two cases which are important. The bosonic cases, in which this eta is plus one. In this case, we speak about a topological quantum system of class uh, A1, and the situation in which this eta is minus one. This is the typical situation for fermion system. This is the time uh, rational symmetry for fermions. And in this case, systems of, of this type are called in class A2. Well, we have mathematical definition. Where is the geometry? To understand the geometry, or more precisely the topology, we have to go from these systems I don't know, as you want. This tau could be any involution, and I will give you different uh, examples. Um, okay, so then I will wait for the At some point, you have to accept that these examples are just uh, examples, and uh, you cannot ask me too much about the physical motivation of many of these examples, but uh, <laughs> maybe you can ask me something more precise uh, at the end or feel you free to ask me what do you want, when do you want, okay? But uh, in principle, uh, at this level, you can consider this tau any map which square to itself from B to B, included the trivial map, the map which uh, fix each point of B, okay? You, you have many choice. Well, when I have a system, when I have a family of isolated band which maybe intersect each other but are separated from a gap from the rest of other bands, this is the meaning of this gap condition, I can construct for each point of my Brulen zone a projection. This is just a projection which to each k project on the eigenspaces of these uh, hem energies. And because of the gap condition, when K varies on the Brulen zone, this projector change continuously. Then I have a continuous family of projection, which depends on the point of my Brulen zone, and the trace of this projection is fixed in this M. The dimension of this projection is fixed in this M. What I can do? I can look for each K at the range of this projection. It is defined a sub-vector space of dimension M in my Hilbert space. And then I have a family of vector space of dimension M which vary continuously inside my Hilbert space. I have also a map which goes from this disjoint union to B. This map has good properties. This disjoint union can be topologized in a good way, etc., etc., etc. What I'm saying is that uh, essentially is that all this structure just define a vector bundle. Now, what is a vector bundle? A vector bundle is simply a collection of vector space of a given dimension which are glued together by the topology of base space. The tangent uh, space of a sphere is an example of vector bundle. We are speaking about these objects, which are not so abstract that they seem initially are very concrete in mathematical physics. We have many situations in which we have, worked, we have to work with vector bundle. Please. Is projection, sorry? Uh, I, guess, uh, I mean, uh, it depends on the, the case and it's continuous, but is uh, this projection uh, analytics? Analytics, you mean analytics? Yeah. Under some assumption, you can deform this projection in an analytic projection, but I don't need to work in an analytic category. I am just in a continuous category. For me, this is uh, enough. 
okay? You can, it depends a little bit on the type of space that you have uh, in general, in quite generality, you can deform it to an analytic uh, projection. Uh, well, usually this construction for uh, the type of system that I described to you has a name, is called the block bundle. I just let me use this name. But what is the role of the time racial symmetry of this block bundle? The time racial symmetry, of course, uh, it became a, a symmetry of this projection which defined this vector bundle and so produced a maps between uh, different fiber of my vector bundle. This map is a map which is anti-linear because uh, in my game I have a complex conjugation in some part. Well, what happened essentially is this. The vector bundle is endowed with an homeomorphism of the total space. This homeomorphism relates the fiber in K with the fiber at tau K, and this anti-linear. Now, when eta is equal to one, this theta just square to the multiplication by plus one in each fiber. This is the case in which my vector bundle is endowed with a real structure, with a big R according to the name which was chosen by Etia, who invented this vector bundle. When eta is minus one, theta square is just the multiplication by minus one in each one of these fiber. Now, this uh, structure was initially called symplectic by Dupont, who was the first to introduce this uh, extra structure vector bundle. I prefer to call it quaternionic with a big Q because, uh, as we will see, uh, oh, you have to also believe in me in some sense, uh, this kind of structure is just saying that each fiber if uh, I have a fixed point uh, under the involution tau, this structure just in no fiber on fixed point with a quaternionic structure. I can define uh, essentially a quaternionic system. I think this name is more appropriate. Well, yes. If if tau is the if tau of k is the identity for each cow for each k, sorry. It simply means that I'm working with the vector bundle in which each fiber is not a complex, a complex vector space, but is a quaternionic vector space. Then I'm vector bundle over quaternionics. Okay, because of that I prefer to call this uh, vector bundle quaternionic with this big Q and uh, in quotation mark according to the real structure. This is the same for real structure, you mean. In this case, if tau is just uh, the trivial map, my complex vector bundle, and though with this, structure, with this structure just became vector bundle over the reals. Okay, fiber which are vector space over the real. Okay, this justif justifies these two names. Well, now, definition, I have a topological quantum system, I have uh, this, uh, two or different notion of uh, uh, time reversal symmetries. In particular, I'm uh, concentrated more on the fermionic time reversal symmetry. What is the topological phase of this system? For me, the correct definition is that the topological phase is just the equivalence classes of this object in its appropriate category, okay? I'm looking at the category of quaternionic vector bundle. I know that there is a notion of isomorphism between two quaternionic vector bundle, which is an isomorphism of vector bundle, which also preserves the quaternionic structure. The equivalence classes of vector bundles, uh, according to this isomorphism, is what I call the topological phase of my system. Main question. Well, I have this, and uh, how can classify then the set of the, equi the equivalence classes of quaternionic vector bundle given an involution tau and space b, at least for low dimension. I would be happy enough I can classify this object in low dimension. Well, let me look first at the literature, what we know for other situations. 
let me just give you the no result for dimension which does not exceed 3, which is the regime of low dimension. In the case of complex vector bundle, this is the case in which I don't have any time reversal symmetry and the underlying vector bundle is just the complex vector bundle. Yes, I have a complete classification. I can classify the topological phases just looking at the second cohomology classes of the base space. And in this case, the map which produces this classification is known as first chain class. Also in the case, of a real structure, in the case in which I have a temporary asymmetry of bosonic type. This category of vector bundle is completely classified by the real first chair number, and the, the topological object which gives the classification is the second cohomology group in the equivalent cohomology of the base space B when the system of coefficient is twisted. I don't want to give you any explanation of what this cohomology is. If you want, I can spend some word. But the main message is that there is a well-defined topological object which provides a list of labels for this theory. And uh, topologists know how to compute this object. And it's completely computable. Let me say more. It's algorithmically computable. OK? Well, what we can say about this missing case here, the quaternionic case? Before to enter more in this, uh, in this argument, let me just uh, uh, say something about the physical application, because we are interested in this stuff, not just because I'm masochist. There are many situations in which uh, this kind of mathematical structure emerged in a natural way. For instance, when I consider periodic uh, system in quantum mechanics, uh, I'm in the situation in which I don't have disorder. Then if I have system invariant under continuous translation, like the free Dirac fermion, for instance, or discrete translation, like a fermion in a crystal, this is uh, the block theory usual, then I can use all the block flock theory on the Fourier theory, and I can just describe my operator as a fiber operator with a direct integral decomposition. This is the typical situation in which this band structure emerged in the literature. And in this case, the time reversal symmetry is just given by a complex conjugation which acts on B, on the Brulen zone, uh, reversing the uh, direction of the quasi moment of, of the momenta. And there are, well, today there are a lot of examples, like gap electronic system, BDG superconductor, photonic crystal. I think that tomorrow we will ask uh, something about this in the talk of Max. For instance, in the case of the free Dirac fermion, the Brillouin, what I call Brillouin zone, this space with this involution is just a sphere. Why a sphere? Well, indeed, it is a, is a plane but they can compatify this plane with a point at infinity. Now, because under the complex conjugation, the momentum is reversed, after the compactification, I have a sphere in which I have two fixed points, the zero momentum, which is fixed under the change of the sign, and the point at infinity. And this involution in this sphere is just a antipodal map on each slice of my sphere. Well, let me then s explain this with some mathematical notation. I'm considering spheres that I denote with this symbol. This is a d-dimensional sphere, which of course is described by d plus one coordinates. And this d here just means that the involution that I'm having here just reverse the sign of the last d coordinates, okay? This is an involutive space, for instance. If you apply two times this map, you just reobtain the initial point. In the case of the Brillouin torus, uh, in this case, uh, the torus is just made by a collection of d circle of type 1, 1. This is the prototype of the circle 1, 1. Uh, when I change, uh, when I apply the complex conjugation, the quasi momentum on this tor tori is just reflected in this way. Okay, also, also each one of these space 
is a, a, an involutive space, and of course the Cartesian product is an involutive space. I just would like to stress that in this case, uh, the, the one-dimensional torus with this involution at two fixed, fixed point, but if, it, if I consider a d-dimensional torus as a Cartesian product of this copy of this object, the number of fixed point is just two at the power d. Well, these were the first example, and uh, to some extent, more or less the only example studied in the literature in which people try to classify quaternionic phase over this space. And we know the result, we know the, the classification. In dimension one, nothing happened. In dimension two, we have this beautiful invariant, which is the Fu Ken MLA invariant, which indeed opened this uh, field of research in topological insulator. It's the first non-trivial example of a, a Z2 phase. In dimension three over the sphere, we still have a, a Z2. Over the, the, the torus, the three-dimensional torus, we have Z2 at the power four, etc., etc., etc. Well, the first proof of this was given by Ken and Meli, and then uh, also full play a role. Uh, the idea is that these topological phases can be distinguished by looking at an invariant, which I call Fuch and Mele index. And this is just given by the product of uh, a, the value of this function. This indeed is just a sign which can be plus or minus one. And the product is given uh, over the fixed point of my Brüllen zone. My Brüllen zone has a certain number of fixed points. I compute this quantity in each one of these fixed points. Sorry, this has to be a k. And then I just uh, multiply this sign. And I look to the final side, it could be plus one and minus one. Uh, this W is a matrix which can be constructed by, just by looking at the block function. And what happened? Happened that uh, over the fixed point, the point which are fixed under the involution, this map is antisymmetric, and so makes sense to consider this matrix is antisymmetric, makes sense to consider the fascia. Well, everything is beautiful, but what happens to this definition when the fixed point set is not a finite collection of points, but maybe is a codomain, is a, a domain in B of codimension uh, of any codimension, or is empty? What happens when it is empty? You see. By construction, this index is constructed ad hoc to explain just these two cases. And uh, in many situations, just uh, make no sense. Well, in the sphere, you have one and two fixed points under the involution. On the tori, you have these two points multiply for the number of spheres that you have. Okay. In this case, uh, you see, you have, uh, for the tori, you have uh, four fixed points, eight fixed points, you see. Well, of course, this result can be obtained with different techniques. Kita have produced the result just looking at the K-theory. It's possible to classify this object in this situation just by an admin construction of the frame and to looking at the abstraction to this frame to be trivial or not. Uh, for instance, uh, Domenico here uh, work exactly in this direction with this collaborator. There is also the possibility to classify this object just looking at the equivalent uh, homotopy. What we did with my colleague, with Gomi, is to try to extend the point of view of the characteristic classes. For complex vector bundle, we have the churn class. For real vector bundle, we have the real churn class. What we have for this quaternionic vector bundle? This was uh, our tentative. And uh, there is a reason. There is a reason to try to do that. Because we want a theory which can be generalized also in involutive space, which are different from sphere and tori. Many of these approaches just fail if you change the ba this base space and you try to consider more general base space. Base space. The K theory, 
in my opinion, it's uh, very nice because it's easily computable, but uh, uh, forgot some information, forgot all the information which comes from the, the stable range. It's a technical word, but in the K theory, you are assuming essentially that you can sum an infinite number of trivial band to your system and you are washing away a lot of topology. There is this approach which uses homotopy, which is the, the most precise of the possible approaches. But the problem of the homotopy that is not computable, it's not algorithmic. We still have a problem uh, to know which is the complete homotopy of the spheres, for instance. The cohomology is nice, uh, from my point of view, because it has more or less the same information of the homotopy, is extremely precise and is algorithmic. There are algorithms to compute homotopy. Well, why I pretend that, that there are example, physical example, in which this base space is not of the type of that I showed to you, and uh, it's important to consider situation in which the fixed point set is not just a finite collection of points, but could be a variety of some codimension. Well, uh, first of all, this quantum system, this topological quantum system, this fiber operator, not necessarily are just the result of a block flow a transform. I can consider a quantum system which is uh, drifted by external parameters, and maybe this parameter can live on some uh, variety and some manifold, which can be quite general. For instance, in a recent uh, work, uh, Gatter Robinson um, he used the idea of a sort of born oppenheimer approximation, and they argue that uh, under certain assumption, the, to a rigid rotor or to a slow dynamics of 1D periodic particle can be associated one of these uh, topological quantum system in which, in the first case, for the rigid rotor, the fixed point set is just empty. Okay, it's just a sphere, a two-dimensional sphere with a complete antipodal involution. And the case of a, a one-dimensional periodic particle, the phase space is just a tori in which one of the coordinates is invariant under the involution, and then the fixed point set is just a collection of two circles. Okay, then we have a case in which the fixed point set is empty, a case in which the fixed point set is a, a manifold, is a manifold, is a, a variety of dimension one. Okay, for these two cases, it's not possible to apply the Fook and ML prescription. The Fook and ML index just make no sense. But nevertheless, it's, possi it's possible to have a topological description. In this case, the topological phases are uh, or even number or odd number according to the number of the energy band that you are looking. In this other case, uh, I have just uh, even number. But let me say, also the construction in this paper is ad hoc for this uh, situation. They try to construct frames and then look at the obstruction for this frame to be trivial. Then again, the question is, there is a general way to classify this quaternion vector bundle when this base space is <coughs> any base space with an involution? Can you maybe say something about what in these concrete examples, uh, the invariant indicates. So, is it something we can understand about the behavior of a rigid rotator? If I uh, in this case, in this case, oh. this invariant agree exactly with the churn classes. Okay, you can prove that at the end of the day, this invariant can be calculated just computing the churn classes, and this, for instance, is giving an information about you. You can put a quaternion structure of this sphere. Okay, uh, if you have m band. You can put a quaternion structure only if the chair number of your vector bundle is even or odd, according if you want to put a quaternion structure on a system of uh, m, an even number of band and odd number of band. 
In this other case, on this torus, for instance, the result tell you that you can construct a quaternionic structure of a tori of this type only if the chair number of your vector bundle is even. Otherwise, you have no chance to put a quaternionic structure. Uh, the coincidence uh, of uh, the quaternionic invariant with the churn classes is something that has to be proved. Indeed, you can prove this one. You can prove this fact. Uh, well, let me just spend a few words about the spirit of uh, the born oppenheimer approximation. Why uh, it just seems a little bit mysterious because uh, people say that for a rigid rotor, this is the, the, the space uh, and uh, stuff like that. Usually, like in the molecular dynamics, we have a system in which we have uh, coordinates which evolve uh, dynamically according to different time scale. For instance, for, a mole for, 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 for an atom, for a molecule, the electronic motion is uh, much more uh, faster than the atomic motion. Then the, born, the spirit of the born Oppenheimer uh, approximation is just to think to this model in first approximation as a model in which the quantum dynamics of the free degrees of, uh, of freedom, of the fast degrees of freedom, adapt instantaneously to the dynamics of the slow degrees of freedom. And to some extent, the dynamics of the slow degrees of freedom can be considered as a, a classical dynamics. Then, in this perspective, it means that the system of this type can be described with a effective Hamiltonian, which is a quantum Hamiltonian for the fast degrees of freedom, which is instantaneously depend by coordinates in the phase space. And this is the phase space of the slow degrees of freedom. This is more or less the philosophy behind the born oppenheimer approximation. Then, just to say that we have essentially a huge zoo of a situation in which we can create topological quantum system which depends on uh, a phase space which has not to be necessary a tori or a sphere or uh, no object. And of course, the time reversal symmetry had, uh, had classical variable. For instance, uh, if for a classical uh, variable, the time reversal symmetry usually leave invariant the position and change the sign of the momenta. This is the reason because uh, in this situation, this is the phase space of a one-dimensional particle which live on a tori. One coordinate is leave invariant, the position coordinate, and the momentum is reversed by the term reversal symmetry. Okay, um, just coming back to the previous question, it's not completely clear to me um, to which physical properties uh, such invariant correspond. I mean, uh, suppose I know that there, there exists uh, such invariants for system. Uh, different types of invariant. Well, I can just uh, answer to your question in this way. You can think of this property as an obstruction to deform your system in a continuous way in another shape, okay? If you want. This is, uh, you can think at this uh, obstruction, you can think at this invariant like something which tell you, okay, you can deform your system up to a certain point, up to the point that you cannot break this invariant. Otherwise, you are changing dramatically, drastically, your system. Indeed, what happens in many situations, we are just closing a gap, for instance. Then, the physical interpretation, uh, like in the case of the quantum wall effect, this seems um, more an exception than a rule. Okay, in the case of the quantum wall effect, we know that this churn number corresponds to the conductivity, but to, to say that, you need a very deep result, which is the Kubo formula which is the result of a response theory, and you have that by magic, the formula which describes the, the conductance or the conductivity, as you want, has the same uh, functional structure of the churn class. But to obtain result of this type, you really need to know your model, you really know to... So this classification is just a first step this classification at this level just say that there are family of system 
which cannot be deformed one in the other continuously without breaking something. Okay? Then, our, if you want, our theory about stabilities, about transformation of this system. Okay? Then the second step of a program of this type is to, to look for, to discover if they are physical quantity like the conductivity on what can be in the case of rigid rotor, which can be measured and, uh, okay, the, the conductivity is this, the class is this. Okay, so if one is interested in a certain quantity, uh, then uh, one may try to associate with uh, an invariant of this kind and then uh, classify materials. Or... But this is, this is the second phase of the problem. You have a problem which is the classification, another problem which is the association to this classification, to associate to this classification and a physical meaning. So for the moment, it's just a geometric work. I repeat, my point of to see this is uh, that there is a physical content. The physical content is the indeformability of one system in the other. Okay? I'm just saying that uh, about Deform deformation, continuous deformation, I cannot change class. If I change class, I'm breaking something. For instance, the existence of gap or the presence of a symmetry. Okay? Well, now, because uh, we are happy now, we know that we can consider many situations which could be more or less interesting just looking, for instance, at this bone open air theory. There is a question. I can complete table like this, in which I consider now sphere, for instance, with whole possible involution, uh, keeping fixed the, the condition that the dimension has not to be bigger than three. This is what we know, and these uh, are the recent uh, results by Gatt and Robinson, and there are a lot of quotation marks. Now, they, they wrote a paper just to consider this case, how many papers we have to write to fill this uh, quotation, these boxes. Indeed, no, we have a technology to do this just by, for free. This is the result in the case of the sphere. Same, in the case of the tori, these are Tori in which the fixed point set uh, is not empty. This is what we know up to today. There are two interesting cases up to dimension three. Also for this, we can classify phases with this result. And also interesting is the case of Tori where the fixed point set is just, uh, is just empty. Also, in this case, we can give a complete answer. I don't want to, now I don't want to enter in detail of what the, the meaning of this classification. What I'm saying is just that uh, with the right tool, you have a, an efficient way to compute this classification for this quaternionic vector bundle over base space in quite generality. You don't have to invent technique ad hoc for each kind of base space. And now let me spend some word about this invariant, which is this invariant that Hallow has to produce this classification in quite generality. This invariant was introduced uh, indeed by me and my colleague Gomi just as a generalization of uh, a, an idea which uh, was uh, proposed initially by Furuta and co-worker, which was uh, uh, the advisor of uh, Chionori. And uh, the idea is that we can classify this vector bundle just looking at a proper cohomology. Oh, now, this beast here, it's quite uh, ugly to, to explain what it is, uh, but you, one can have some intuition of what it is, this object, just looking at this exact sequence. Here I have a map which goes from the fixed point set of the space that I'm considering to this sphere which has uh, uh, only two fixed points. Here I have a real line bundle over B. 
And here I have just the usual uh, line bundle uh, over reals all over the fix, fixed point of the, my Brew Lens on T. In some sense, this cohomology is just uh, looking at the difference between a line bundle and the equivariant map, uh, which can change locally on the fixed point set the sign of my line bundle. And we classified these two situations using this cohomology under the assumption that B, the fixed point set of B, is a finite collection of a fixed point. But for all the reasons that I tell you, we, we are, we were not happy with this result. We want to improve, improve a little bit this, uh, this classification. And indeed, is what we finally was able to do in our last work. And this is the main result that we have. First of all, the big part of the result is in the construction of this group. This group, this group indeed, uh, we call the Picard group R, is just given by the a line bundle, a real line bundle, a line bundle with real structure with our involutive space, plus a section which uh, is a section of the restriction of this line bundle over the fixed point set. Okay, then we have a real line bundle, we can restrict the real line bundle over, over the fixed point set, we consider a, a, a section, and we consider the pairs of uh, this object, line bundle, real line bundle, and a section over the fixed point, and we can just consider the equivalence classes of this object. Now, this uh, guy is here, is a group. And there is a theorem that tells you us that indeed this group is canonically isomorphic to this cohomology. Usually the cohomology are a billion group. Then to one side we have this obscure cohomology, and on this side we have a geometric realization of, of this cohomological group. And because this is a group homomorphism, what we have to do is just to find a way to associate to a quaternionic vector bundle an object here. If we find a, a map between quaternionic vector bundle and this Picard group, automatically then we can go to the cohomology just using this kappa tilde. Now, why I claim that a quaternionic vector bundle indeed produces canonically an, obje an object here? And, uh, the way is quite straightforward. If I have a quaternionic vector bundle, I can consider the determinant line bundle. Then, because this is in particular is a complex vector bundle, I know how to construct the uh, line bundle. And because the dimension, the rank of my fiber is even, when I consider the determinant of this uh, map, the determinant of this map just is something that will square to minus one at power two m, then at two plus one, indeed is a real involution, is not a quaternionic involution. Then the determinant construction just map a quaternionic vector bundle in a real line bundle. And second, the, okay, this is a theorem, you have to prove that when you look the restriction of the determinant line bundle over the fixed point set of your uh, base manifold, there exists only one section. Okay, the, the way in which you can choose this section is unique. Then, to a quaternionic vector bundle, there exists, it, you, it can be associated a unique couple given by a line bundle and a quaternion, a, and, and canonical section, which is an, an element of this group. This group is isomorphic to this cohomology. Now we can define this invariant. And this is, uh, a nice definition because have a lot of good properties. With this definition, what it turns out that uh, isomorphic Q-bundles, quaternionic vector bundle, are the same invariant. If E theta is the trivial quaternionic vector bundle, this invariant is just zero, or can be normalized to be zero. K is natural under the, the, the pullback. What it means? It means that if I consider construct the pullback of my quaternionic vector bundle, the 
invariant of a pullback is the pullback of the invariant. And this is extremely important properties because this quaternion vector bundle can be in quite generality constructed as the pullback under a um, equivalent map of a classifier uh, of just one universal classifying space. And this property just tells us that K indeed is a characteristic class, like the Chern class is for complex uh, vector bundle. It respects the direct sum. The invariant for a sum of uh, quaternioni vector bundle is the sum of the invariant. I'm using just the, the, the plus in the sense that the cohomology is an abelian group, then I can use this uh, symbol as uh, operation in this abelian group. Because quaternioni vector bundle are classified by a universal uh, quaternioni vector bundle under an equivalent map, it exists a representative, a universal representative of these characteristic classes. And the characteristic, this uh, FKMM class of each quaternioni vector bundle is just the pullback of a universal object. This is also important because this is also a property satisfied by the churn classes. The churn classes of a vector bundle are just the pullback of the universal churn classes of the Grassmannian. We know this. Well, more important, when the base space is just a finite collection of points, then this generalized invariant just agree with the foo, can, and male invariant then what I'm proposing is really a generalization of the Fouquet and ML invariant. And now the interesting point, when uh, Bt is just empty, automatically this invariant reduced to the real churn classes of the uh, real line bundle. There is a little bit more, because you, usually we know that this quaternionic vector bundle has to be of even rank, because the Kramer uh, degeneracy, you, we have argument of this type. But in the situation in which the involutive space has not fixed a point, we can also construct quaternionic vector bundle of uh, hot rank. In particular, we can construct quaternionic line bundle. It's possible. And, uh, uh, well, we have also information of this type. We can classify the quaternionic line bundle in the situation in which the fixed point is just empty. And in particular, the, the family of quaternionic line bundle cannot be a group, of course, because if you multiply with tensor product the two quaternionic line bundle, you obtain something which has not a quaternionic structure but a real structure. But nevertheless, the family of quaternionic line bundle is a torsor over the real line bundle. This provides information how to classify, for instance, the quaternionic, uh, the quaternionic line bundle, and what it turns out that they are classified exactly by the second cohomological group of uh, B. There is a mistake because, uh, because I'm considering the situation in which BT is the empty set, I don't have to put here this B tau. Sorry for the mistake. Well, this is the good news, which are the less good news. Usually, like in the complex case or in the real case, we want a classification in low dimension. It means when the dimension of the space is not bigger than three. And what we know is that this map is injective. This is good news. Then it really represents a way to distinguish between uh, uh, different uh, classes. And in all the situation that I showed you, the sphere of the type P, Q, the tor tori of type A, B, C, this map is indeed bijective. Then one can ask, but is in general bijective this map, at least in low dimension, as the Chern class is for complex vector bundle or as the real Chern class is in the case of real vector bundle? Well, usually the, the, the answer is, is not completely affirmative. What we know that in the case in which the fixed point set is empty, yes, quaternionic, uh, even rank quaternionic vector bundle are completely classified by this second cohomology class. And uh, in the case of odd rank quaternionic vector bundle are classified by this cohomology class 
if it exists at least one quaternionic like bundle or the set of even rank quaternionic vector bundle is empty if in particular you cannot construct any quaternionic vector bundle. But in the most general situation in which B tau is different from the empty set, then we have bijectivity only up to dimension two. And we know, because we have a contra-example, that in dimension three, this map failed to be bijective, but is only injective. Well, then, conclusion, uh, we have an object, we have a, a class, a characteristic class which called K, which is uh, this F, K hem hem invariant from the name, uh, the initial of the name of the initial people that who think to this object, which have <coughs> more or less hold the property of the chain classes for complex vector bundle, but it, this is the invariant which classify this quaternionic structure. And up to dimension two work perfectly in all possible situation. In dimension three, well, work quite well because injective, what we lost in general is just the surjectivity with respect to this cohomology class, which can be a little bit bigger usually than the number of, re of possible topological phases of this quaternionic phase. Well, I think that I have finished. So, uh, sorry to keeping, for keeping torturing you about this, no, but please. Uh, if I think of um, a topology called insulator, okay, so my Brillouin zone is really a Brillouin zone, your B is a Brillouin zone. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the typical example, of, I mean, a typical example of a system that, to which this theory applies? Well, if you, if you are on the Brillouin zone, <laughs> Everything has been already done. You have uh, you, you, you have the I think the best way to compute these uh, phases is just to look uh, at the. No, no, but I, I mean uh, a concrete Hamiltonian, which I mean a concrete material setting, whatever, which falls in this general category of uh, with time in a reversal symmetry, uh, etc. I mean, uh, a concrete example, do you have one? Well, I repeat, if you want a concrete example, uh, you have this concrete example constructed by Kane and Mealy. And, uh, but in this case, what, I'm, what I mean, in this situation in which the base space is just a two-dimensional torus with the involution which is given by the complex conjugation after the block Floquet transform, which it means that uh, it reverse point, but have just four fixed points uh, on the Brillouin zone. The classification uh, is completely given by this map, and this is concrete enough. Once you have your Hamiltonian, your concrete model, you have just to compute the block function, uh, and you can construct this W, and this is a way. Yeah, but what would be the concrete model? I mean what would be the Hamiltonian? One Hamiltonian which has this... You, you have just to take the four by four Pauli, well, uh, not Pauli, the equivalent of the four by four Pauli matrices and you have to write a linear combination in such a way to force a, a temporary asymmetry of this type. It's possible to write a, a several concrete model of this type. This is the best way to produce a, a time-binding Hamiltonian, which has uh, uh, four bands, which are separated by a gap around the zero energy. You just look at the positive eigenvalue, and this gives you a vector bundle dimension two. And, uh, well. Any other comment? Okay. So just a comment about your question. Um, it's obvious, but uh, this is the quantum spin hole effect, in fact. So you have the kane milli model, for example, where you have the effective Hamiltonian, and you can compute this invariant. Okay. So. Well, I can explain you later, maybe, but yes.
Yes, but this is just a way to, to, to give a name. Yes, uh, absolutely. At, at the end of the day, if you want concrete model uh, without uh, <coughs> giving any name, you can just really play with uh, mm -hmm. some representation of a Clifford algebra of some dimension. And, uh, but that's quite what I would call the concrete model. <laughs> Well, you see, when you have, when you have a time-binding model, uh, you, at the end of the day, you have to construct matrices. And uh, time-binding models are extremely concrete because a result of uh, approximation which are uh, very well controlled in the literature. I have a system, I just am interested to look at the dynamic and uh, energy window. I just restrict my operator uh, around this energy window and you have, for instance, uh, a, a technique which is called the pyre substitution, which gives you an effective model which is a matrix dependent, is a matrix which depends by the point of a brilliant zone. And because it's a matrix, you can spend these matrices, for instance, on the basis of a Clifford algebra. Then this model, which uh, seems toy model, are extremely effective. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, can you generalize your approach to um, uh, base space with uh, boundaries? Uh, I think that it's possible, but at the same time, I think that uh, you have to check some technicalities. Uh, we avoid to, to go in this direction just because we, there are a certain number of technicalities that uh, for this moment I just I would like to avoid, but yes, in principle, it's possible. Uh, so, uh, as far as I understand, this, this cohomology is some kind of uh, equivariant cohomology, right? It is. And uh, uh, so there is this uh, uh, technique in the business called localization formulae that uh, allow you to sort of uh, extract, I mean, to pass from this, uh, the, the cohomology group to, I don't know, this Z2 or uh, Z, uh, uh, these numbers by having some formula which, uh, I mean, compute certain qual quantities on the fixed point uh, set of your uh, base manifold. But Is this applicable to this kind of equivalent cohomology that you use? Or? I, I think that impossible is applicable, but I don't think that, uh, well, in all the examples that we investigate, we, we had the need to, to do that. Um, to be precise, I'm not completely sure that uh, this localization has a trivial extension to this theory, because this theory from one side is... Uh, well, just let me... From one side is equ equivalent. This Z2 here means that this is an equivalent cohomology. Uh, this BT just means that this is the relative cohomology. Okay, then you have a, a, a space, you have a subspace, you are just computing the relative cohomology of the space with respect to another subspace. It just, this just poses some problem in the sense that you have to restrict the co-chain. But this is not the big problem. The big problem is here. You have a, a system of local coefficients. It means that you can think to this cohomology as a cohomology in the shift theory where here you have a, a shift which is equivalent. Now, I'm not sure, and or maybe I don't know by ignorance if this localization technique has been extended to situation in which the equivalent homology has a local uh, coefficient system. And this is technically not trivial if you want to work in this way. On the other side, when I claim that this homology is computable, I mean that uh, you can prove a lot of good property, like uh, Essentially, you have all the exact sequence that you have for usual cohomology. Gizin sequence, uh, Meyer Vietoris uh, exact sequence, uh, um, uh, excision. And with this tool, 
you really can simplify very complicated space, at, at least in the, in the situation which we, we work with CW complex, essentially to the cohomology of some circle and some uh, sphere. And with this technique, we indeed compute all the cohomology that we need without using uh, more sophisticated techniques. If not, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>